Amen. Good evening. It is great to see everybody here this evening. We have a little rain coming, a little spring shower, which is always makes me smile. I don't know if it makes you smile, but I like to get a little break and get a little bit of rain. But I know it brings up the allergies. Uh, the wind the other day, and Tracy's not feeling too good. Um, her allergies are really hurting her, so pray for her. I'm, I'm sure there's others here. I have allergies, but they're not that bad yet. Um, but it's uh, hopefully you all had such a wonderful day. It's been a glorious Lord's Day. It always is when we come together, and and um, we rejoice at our new elders, Tommy Tuggle and Tom Lowe, and uh, we're excited to serve uh, with them. And um, wonderful men, and and we're just so thankful uh, through our elders and through this congregation that God has appointed them to help lead this congregation. You know, I used to love watching that sitcom, that comedy sitcom, Home Improvement. I don't know if uh, you ever watched it with Tim Allen, but it's one of my favorite shows. And sometimes I, I still go to some of these channels and they have it on there, and I like to, I like to watch it. I love Tim, the tool man, Taylor. You know, and he's very knowledgeable with uh, tools, but he always wanted to have more power. You know, he always tried to add to these power tools, and it always went wrong. You know, it always... He always messed up projects, and he, he always hurt himself. And uh, it, that, that proved for great comedy, didn't it? Uh, I am not a really big tool guy. I'm just not real handy. Like uh, many men in here are very handy with tools and handy with their hands. I wasn't blessed with, with that type of blessing. I like to sometimes do basic things, and tools are pretty cool. But, you know, you, you have specific tools uh, for specific jobs. You do not use a, a sawzall. You do not use a reciprocating saw to cut a long straight line on a board. You know, you're going you're gonna to use a skill saw, a circular saw, right? Am I right on that? I hope I'm right on that. <laughs> you know, just, uh, and some have those little lasers on them, right? Tommy showed me on his. I'm like, that's cool because I could actually, if I use his, I think I could get a straight line. Other, otherwise, then I better not touch him. But you know, we have those specific tools for specific jobs, and our tongues are, are a tool, aren't they? They're a powerful member of our bodies that are used for speech, that are used for uh, communication. However, if we are not careful, and I, and, I, and I say this with experience, if we're not careful, we could use our tongue incorrectly, and we could cause much harm. I have before... Uh, I would like to say I have a long time ago, but I have, you know, I have in, in my life as a Christian, you know, and I, I know I've mended this before, I, and, and I'm not a proud of, at times, getting angry or saying something that I shouldn't say or typing something that I shouldn't type, and, and I'm reminded of that. My wife doesn't remind me, someone else does, and I'm glad that they do, because I want to do the right thing to God. I want to use this tongue for edification and to glorify God, not not to... Not to be somebody that looks at me and says, wow, he's a preacher. You know, how are we using our tongues? We look at ourselves each, each day we live. How are we using our tongues? We must use the tongue to bring about blessings and not battles. Not, not for bad. Tonight we're going to look at James chapter 3. We've been going through James, the book of James, on Sunday nights and and yes, I, you know, I, I did go over this lesson, not the same exact lesson, but I did cover this topic. I think it's been about maybe a year, year and a half or so, about how to kill our tongues. And we're going to revisit this lesson now that we're in James chapter 3. You know, we're going we're gonna to do so for two reasons. We're going to do so, first of all, because all the false teachings that we see. And I'm not talking about those in the world. Those in the world are to be expected. I'm talking about in the church. Also, all the hate speech going on. Same thing. Not in the world, because we expect hate speech to go on in the world. It's pretty sad, but it, it, it happens all around us. But I'm talking about hate speech in the church. James first states, Teachers have a great responsibility to teach truth. As we start out in James chapter 3, verse 1, he says, Do not become teachers in large numbers, my brother, since you know that we who are teachers will incur a stricter judgment. You know, as we gain that factual knowledge of God's Word and we use it to teach, we need to do so uh, with sound 
doctrine. We need to do so and teach what God teaches. It needs to be in line with the Word, with the truth. What comes out of our mouths can cause others to go down the wrong path. And they can follow false doctrine. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine if someone said, well, Matt taught me this. Tom taught me this. Jack taught me this. You know, that, we're, we're not going to do that. But imagine if someone said that and someone actually heard something out of our... I'm not, I'm not talking about making a mistake. You know, there's times we make mistakes. You know, I, I, I first admit that there's a lot I don't know. You know, but I do my best. And I know preachers, other preachers, Chuck and others, will do their best to study and to bring the truth when they teach and they preach. Sometimes we may get it wrong. That, that, that happens. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not saying we don't mess up. I'm talking about that you teach false doctrine. It, 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 you're teaching something that God does not teach. You know, in, in the first century, there, there were false teachers, and we could think of, of those in Ephesus and other places, the Judaizers, and teaching that one needed to be you know, circumcised in order to be saved. And there's other false doctrine going on. And we can look all around us today and we can see that there is false teaching. And even in the church, this church of Christ, just because it says church of Christ does not mean they're teaching the truth. So James says teachers will have a stricter judgment. And this gives indication that there are degrees of punishment. You know, James here, when he says, do not become teachers, he's not uh, trying to discourage anyone from becoming teachers. We know at, at a time as Christians, we, we get baptized, we're new babes in Christ, we ought to be teachers like it teaches in Hebrews chapter 6, I think. We ought to be teachers of chapter 5. You know, we can't be on that milk. We've got to get into the meat eventually. But you've got to be careful to become teachers. As teachers have a great responsibility to teach the truth because you're leading others to heaven. Teachers who teach false doctrine, they're going to face condemnation. They're going to be harshly judged by God, 2 Peter chapter 2. So if you do not know what you are talking about, you do not know what actually you're teaching. Don't teach it. Stay silent. Go learn the Word and then teach what God teaches you through the Bible, through the Word of God. The second part of James, starting in verse 2, and James states that the tongue has the power to build up, and it has the power to break down. Look at verse 2 of our text. It says, For we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to bridle the whole body as well. See, we all sin. We, we all sin and fall short of the glory of God. Romans chapter 3, verse 23. There are many ways in, in which we can fall short of God's glory. If one is able to hold his tongue, he is able then to be under self-control. But the tongue may be a small part of our body, but it is a powerful weapon. It can make us submit to it. It has the power to, to be used to destroy others. It's a huge and powerful weapon if we are not careful. And then James uses illustrations to show how powerful and destructive the tongue can be. Look at verse 3. It says, Now if we put the bits in the horse's mouth so that they will obey us, we direct their whole body as well. James 3, verses 3. He uses that illustration of a bit in a horse's mouth. You know, it is a small little bit that's attached, I believe, to the reins. I mean, I, I used to ride with friends down when I went down into Fresno. I haven't uh, rode a horse in a long time. I'm not a cowboy. I'm a, I'm a cowboy fan. You know, but, but, you know, just that little bit in a horse's mouth, and it can control that massive animal. Well, what about our tongues? Our tongues are a small part of the body, and what can it do to us if we're not careful? If we do not practice self-control. Also, look what he says in verse 4. 
about a small rudder. Look at the ships, too. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are nevertheless directed by a very small rudder wherever the inclination of the pilot determines. A small little rudder on this huge ship, and you, you have the current of the ocean, and you have these big waves, and you have these strong winds that come in, but that little rudder could turn that whole ship. It could direct that whole ship. What does the tongue do to the whole body? To our very person, if we're not careful. Look at verses four, uh, 5 and 6. So also the tongue is a, vi- a small part of the body, and yet boasts of great things. See how great a forest is set aflame by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire. Look at that. The tongue's a fire. The very world of what? The very world of iniquity, the tongue is set among our members as that which defiles the entire body and sets on fire the course of our life. And is set on fire by hell. Doesn't take much, does it? You see these huge forest fires in California every spring, every summer. And a lot of them are started by just a little spark. Just a little, and this huge fire. Just thousands and thousands of acres. It doesn't take much. It doesn't take much for our tongue to bring us down. And think about that. Our tongues could cause us to miss heaven. You ever thought about that? You imagine standing before God, and He says, you could not control that tongue. Now James does say the tongue is untamable. We can't use that as an excuse, can we? We cannot. James tells us the tongue is just a little flame. It is a fire, verse 6. He states in 7 and 8 that the tongue is a restless evil. And he says this, it is full of deadly poison. So let's think about you and I. How are we using our tongues out there when the world out there, and we see all the ugliness out there, we see people attacking people, and people calling people names, and, and just what's gone on. I mean, it, I, I'm not, I know it's not, nothing new, but especially in the last year and two, two or three months with this COVID, and all this that's going on, and people on one side, and, and people on the other side, and all this fighting, it's horrible, isn't it? And if we're not careful, we can become part of that mess. I know I have to watch my tongue. Notice what James states in uh, 9 and 10. He says, With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who have been made in the likeness of God. Think about that. In the likeness of God, we curse them. From the same mouth come both blessings and cursing. My brothers and sisters, these things should not be this way. Does a spring sent out from the opening, opening both fresh and bitter water? Can a fig tree, my brothers and sisters, bear olives, or a vine bear figs? Nor can salt water produce fresh. See, we use the tongue for good, but we can also use the tongue for bad. And God says this should not be. It does not work. Fresh Water does not go with bitter water. They cannot both come out of the same spring or the same faucet. God has given each and every one of us the power to, to communicate. Words mean a lot to God. In Matthew chapter 12, verse 36, he says, But I tell you that for every careless word that people speak, they will give an account of it on the day of judgment. We will be judged, that's right, by our words. That's scary, isn't it? When I think of the things that I've said, things that I've wrote, it's scary. Yes, James tells us our words can be used as weapons. You know, we, we, we've heard that sticks and stones may break my bones, but names shall never hurt me. It should be sticks and stones may break my bones, but names cut so deep it could kill me. That's how it should go because words do mean something. And 
Words cut deep. Words destroy people, destroy people's reputations. I couldn't imagine somebody just being hurt by my words, but taking their life because of what I've said to them, what I've done to them with my mouth, with my tongue. That would be hard to live with. Many lives have been ruined by rumors. Many lives have been ruined by gossip. You know, we like to focus on in the church, you know, those major sins in the church. But not often do we ever realize what the tongue does, what gossip does, what name calling does. And most of the time, though, when, when someone has gossip on someone else, it's lies. But it's still going to hurt. Still going to run them down. And once it's done, it can't be undone. It destroys. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 21 says, Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. It is up to us whether we choose to use our tongues for good or use our tongues for bad. Do we want to use our tongues for life or do we want to use our tongues for death? We have a choice. We can't say, I, I, I didn't mean it or, or I can't help it. To the Pharisees, Jesus stated this in Matthew chapter 12, verse 34 and 35. He says, you offspring of vipers. Yeah, he used a, he, he used a name because it was true. You, and he's Jesus. You know, well, Jesus' name called, I could do it. No. Jesus is calling them out for what they are. And he's the son of God. He can. How can you, being evil, express any good things? For the mouth speaks from that which fills the heart. The good person brings out of his good treasure good things, and the evil person brings out of his evil treasure evil things. You know, the solution to having a tongue acceptable to God is putting God on our hearts. Having God in our lives, living like Jesus every day, walking with Jesus every day. The tongue, as James states, can be untamable. But God tames the tongue. God transforms us to think and to speak and to live godly lives. We see that in Romans chapter 12. When we're putting on what God tells us what we need to do, we're going to watch our mouths. We're going to watch our tongues. When we're praying, when we're studying, when we're thinking of Jesus, when we're constantly doing what God wants us to do, it's going to be hard to use our tongue for bad. We're going to be using our tongues for good. So what do we do? With God on our hearts, we use our words to praise God and to give grace to others. We've been talking about uh, Christian living. We've been talking about the Christian influence in Matthew and also in James. Christians are not to speak how the world speaks. If we're sounding like the world, then there's a big, big problem. Look what Paul states to the church at Ephesus in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29. He states, Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth, but only such as is good for building up, as fits with the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. We must determine what corrupt speech is. There are Christians out there that I know of that, that don't believe that a few curse words is, is all that bad. Yeah. we got to do so not by our own definition, or our, our own uh, opinions. Cursing t- is corrupt. We, we, we have a scripture that tells us so. Taking God's name in vain is corrupt. Breaking down others with our tongues is corrupt. Name-calling is corrupt. When we have r- make rumors about others, when we gossip about others, that is corrupt speech. If we speak that something that is not necessary, or there's something necessary, unnecessary, I should say, then we, we shouldn't speak it at all. Why would we say something if it's not necessary or if it's going to hurt someone? 
the best thing to do is to remain silent. For example, being brutally honest. Well, I was, I was honest. And I'm not saying to be dishonest, but there are times where you don't need to be that honest. You don't need to say anything at all. But saying something that does not need to be said at times could hurt someone else. And we need to think before we speak so we do not hurt others. I'm not saying if you have something to say to them to help them, you, you take them to the side and with a love on your heart, you could say something say, hey, you know, but sometimes we're so brutal. Brutally honest. You know, ch children are brutally honest, aren't they? And they get a pass. You know, I, I'm just waiting to see what Charlie says to me sometimes. You know, I'm just going to have to giggle. Not I don't say they get a pass pass. They can talk how they want, but you know what I mean. When, when they're being childlike or childish, that, they're just that way. But not us. We can't say, well, the kids do that. You know, we've got to watch our tongue. Unnecessary words at times can make a situation worse. So what do we do? Just be kind. We have, we have heard that saying, if you don't have anything nice to say, do not say anything at all. I think that's great advice. It goes right along with what Paul says in Colossians chapter 4, verse 6. Let your speech, and he says, always be seasoned with salt, right? And always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. It's when we are kind, when we show others our speech is seasoned with salt. How Christ wants us to speak. It has a very powerful influence on others in this life. Proverbs chapter 60, verse 24 states, Gracious words are like a honeycomb, sweetness to the soul and health to the body. How are we using our tongues? What does our words look like on a daily basis? We need to make sure that what we speak is of the truth. Sound doctrine when we teach the Word of God. The only way we're going to teach sound doctrine if we have our minds, our hearts, and the Bible. And we're learning it. Our words need to be helpful. Our words need to be influential. Our words need to be necessary. Our words need to be kind. Our words need to be loving. Edifying. Building people up instead of breaking them down. There's so much ugliness in the world. And God, society needs to look at each and every one of us here and see our light shining, see Christ shining, see us using that, that, those words of the Bible. Seasoned with salt. Gracious words. That's how we want to use our tongue. The lesson is yours tonight. If you are sub subject to the invitation, uh, we didn't really have an invitation today. But the invitation actually is always open. It doesn't have to be at the end of the sermon. I could get up there and someone could say, I want to be baptized. Well, we'll wait till later. You know, we got to do the sermon first. We got to do some songs. And No, we, we go do it. We go, go do it. If you're ready now, let's do it. If you're ready. You study the Word of God and you're ready to commit your life to Him. Do not wait till next week. It's too important. Do it now. It's your soul. If you need prayer, Prayer is powerful, isn't it? You hear people out there, and I'm not putting anybody down, but I'll pray for you, and I'll pray for you, and I'll pray for you. And hopefully they're being sincere, and hopefully they know what they're talking about when they say, I'm going to pray for you. I'm not judging anybody. When we say, I'm going to pray for you, pray. Pray right then. Don't say, I'm going to pray for you later. I had a friend that used to be my neighbor. The other day, he called me, which I was... Kind of surprised because I, you know, we first he, he put a message on Facebook said, Man, I need to talk to you. So I talked to him. He's going through a hard time and he says, Can you pray for me? You know, it's easy to say, Yeah, I'll pray for you and then get off the phone. I says, You want me to pray for you now? I'd love to pray for you right now. He says, Yes, I would love that. We're not face to face. You don't have to be. On the phone, I prayed for him. Pray for each other. If you need to come up today, tonight, let's pray together for you. I'll say this all the time, and I know you know it. We are a family. We are a family of God. It's not about blood, is it? I know there's bl blood relatives here that are Christians. That's a wonderful thing. But we are the family of God. 
Love you all. If you need anything, come forward as we stand and we sing the invitation song.